thank you for squeezing into this um, intimate setting on time. So uh, I'm going to honor uh, your commitment by starting on time. Thank you very much indeed. And my apologies for those of you who are looking at the back of my head, but I have eyes there, not least through that one-way glass. So don't think you've been forgotten in any way. We are hyper-connected, and there you can see the hashtag. So please use that, because it's a way of you reflecting as you listen to our guests uh, on what you think they're saying, whether you like it, whether you don't like it, new points as well, and I can inject them rather than coming necessarily uh, to you at some point during the discussion. But I do want to come to you pretty soon on, because in the end, many of you will have questions about trust or, or not, uh, and you will have your own views, and also maybe your ideas of the direction of travel that we can uh, take this in uh, in the next uh, 58 minutes or so. Let me introduce uh, the panel, because it's not quite as you expected, uh, and I hope actually that means you'll st you have even more incentive to stay, uh, because uh, we have uh, five guests, as you can see, and let me introduce them. Mark Benioff, who is Chairman and Chief Executive uh, of uh, Salesforce, uh, then we have Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Welcome, Tim, a professor of engineering at MIT uh, and computer science and artificial intelligence lab. Then we have Mike Fries, uh, president and chief executive of uh, Liberty Global, 28 years in the cable and media industry. Uh, Marissa Mayer, welcome, uh, who is president and chief executive officer of Yahoo. And we're delighted that we've been joined by the new Commissioner for the Digital Economy and Society, uh, the, uh, the European Commissioner, Gunther Oettinger. Welcome, um, indeed. Now, this is about trust. I can summarize, but I suspect all of you know where the issues of trust are in this. Uh, and as we are hyper-connected, please do use that hashtag uh, if you want to, to, to get your voice over and your thoughts over uh, at this point. Of course, if we ask the question, um, in tech we trust, and uh, how can trust in the hyper-connected world and company be preserved, the questions come up of uh, who can be trusted, uh, what can be trusted, what is the problem? And that's where I'd like to get to initially. How significant is the problem? And Mark Benioff, can I come to you first? Because you have just written an article, The Digital Revolution Needs a Trust Revolution. You're accepting there is an issue here. Why are hyperconnected companies worrying about preserving trust and what have they got to do? Well, I think that uh, you know, we're in an incredible uh, shift in the technology industry. We've seen the world move, of course, into uh, cloud computing. We've seen the world move into social networks. We've seen the world now move into mobility. I'm sure how many people here have a mobile phone with them? Everybody, why even ask the question? And they should be using and, it because they should be using the hashtag. And <laughs> So don't switch it off. <laughs> And, and we're about to move into the world of data science and artificial intelligence as well. And what that's yielded uh, for our industry is that we've gone from kind of when, where we started with systems of record, we've moved into these major systems of engagement, which includes consumer systems of engagement, and now we're about to move into systems of intelligence. But none of these things will maintain their form, and none of them will have ref referential integrity unless customers trust them. And that's really where we are today. And you know, what we see is different organizations taking on different characteristics of trust and also different levels of transparency, which will ultimately yield where we're going with trust. And, uh, you know, ultimately only through radical transparency are we going to get radical new levels of trust, which is where we have to get to um, to make this new world really work. Given that you've written about it, do you think the industry and those in it, the big corporations, the smaller corporations, those moving very fast, accept and understand the level of uh, the, 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 this issue has now uh, cr been created? In other words, trust is a serious problem now. Trust is a serious problem. You've, you can see it across the world. I don't have to go through the stories. Everyone here has got their own personal story. Everybody has seen a societal to. story or a cultural story. The reality is we all have to step up and get to another level of uh, openness and uh, transparency. And that's not necessarily uh, comfortable for everybody, especially the vendors. So whether you're a you know enterprise vendor, which is where we are, or you're a consumer vendor like Marissa, we need to all kind of open up a lot more to be able to say exactly where, where is the data, what's going on with the data, who has the data, and if there's a problem with the data, whether it's a security problem or some other issue with the data, immediate disclosure, complete and total transparency. That is, no secrets, because only through that transparency are we going to 
get to a higher level of trust. And that is not where we are uh, today, as we all know. Marissa, a social media website, news provider, video and content provider, search engine. Where do you think the issue of trust is? How much under pressure do you now feel? Uh, I think that what I bump up to is to say personalized technology is better technology and a personalized internet is a better internet. And when it means for you to have a personalized internet, you need to store your data in the cloud. So the question is, you know, what do we need to do to get people comfortable with that? And ultimately, trust is about someone weighing trade-offs. How, pri how much privacy do I have? How secure do I feel? What are the benefits that I get in exchange for that? And I agree with Mark, you need to have transparency in that world, but I think you also need to afford to the individual choice and control. It comes down to being able to make a statement the users own their data. They should be able to examine it, take it with them, bring it to other sites, bring it to under other vendors that they trust more, basically have a system and a market that basically helps people make these trade-offs and these decisions. Um, but they should have control over whether or not they, how they use the system and whether they use the system at all. Is it clear to you the state of trade-off at the moment in the minds of the public out there? Difficult to generalize with the public, but you know where I'm taking you. I think that overall, People sometimes have a difficult time making these trade-offs because arguably some of the vendors are not being transparent enough, not providing enough controls and choice. And I think that as we address that, it will make it much clearer for people the types of trade-offs they want to make. Because, of course, when you look at mature industries, for example, we all tell um, our governments where we live, what we look like in order to drive. We all tell our governments exactly how we make, much money we make and how we make it in order to you know, partake in civil services. So there's a lot of areas where people already give up a lot of information about themselves. Without privacy. knowing it often. And, and, but they ultimately get a lot of benefit. And I just think that... But without the, knowing it. Well, I think often. sometimes you know it and sometimes you don't. And so you know, if you start to look at various you know, communications companies, payment companies, they do have a lot of data. But I think that when you see... How, if you know where that data is being stored, how it's being used, and you're given choice around it, I think that that actually goes a long way. Mike Fries, what's clear in your company about uh, where this is going on, rules and responsibilities? Mm -hmm. um, you service tens of millions around the world, uh, and you know what they watch, you know who they call, you know how they use what you put into their houses or onto their smartphones or whatever. What are the rules and responsibilities? Are they clear to you at the moment? Are you under pressure? So... Um Today, with all the data you described, let's give you some facts. We probably, on average, have access to 50 billion hours of viewing from our 27 million customers and 30 billion clicks a month. And today, we do nothing. Zero. What do you mean you do nothing? We generate zero revenue from all of that information. I'm going to lead to a, tell you what I'm, where I'm going here. <laughs> I think there, there is a big problem with trust today. I think we've all seen this train wreck coming. Um, and why is that? Well. Consumers have shared everything about their personal lives, of course, on the web. 90% feel like they've lost control. 85% have tried to do something to protect themselves. But 60% know that they're in trouble when it comes to sharing that information. And uh, secondly, you've got a big disconnect between, public, between uh, data protection and data retention for purposes of the government, for example. So on one hand, we're, the governments are saying we've got to protect consumers, we've got to make sure consumers' uh, you know, data is, is protected in Europe and elsewhere. On the other hand, we have to retain that data because we might need that data to, you know, for government or security purposes. So there's a disconnect there that has them worried. And then uh, thirdly, you have things like uh, what's happened with Sony and, and, and state terrorism and, and all these things have gotten them nervous. Net neutrality has them convinced that someone's out there to screw them. Uh, it's surprising to me consumers you know, aren't even more worried about what's happening. Big data is big business for a lot of people. We're not one of them. We'd like to be, but... Uh, what's, you know, what's holding you back? It's this issue. It, it's, it's a concern about whose data is it. Let's start with that. So you've taken an active decision. But we're starting to work our way into it. I mean, we're going to find a way to monetize this, but we have some principles. First principle is with consent. We won't do anything in terms of personalized viewing and or using your data for any other purpose unless you approve it. That's the small print, the terms and conditions, no, which no one print. reads. When you sign up, when you put our new advanced TV box in your household and you log on, the first question is, will you allow, do you want us to use any of your data for personalized viewing, yes or no? 70% say yes, and they sure like the fact that we're asking them. It's not as if we use it first and ask them second. We, we ask them first and use it second, and that's a big difference between you know, social media or other aspects of their, of their internet experiences. So um, I think there is a big trust problem. I think 
If you're transparent, that's the right word. If you, if you ask their consent first, um, if, if you're open about what's happening, whether it's lawful intercept or what you might be doing with the data, then there's a chance of continuing to monetize. It's a $150 billion business, big data. So. But let me be absolutely clear before I go to, to Tim and the Commissioner. Um, when you say you're doing nothing, that is an active decision at the Correct. moment. Correct. To do nothing until you're absolutely sure Correct. about the implications. Absolutely right. Correct. And and you're at the moment, you reckon you're denying yourself um, cash flow? Well, the av I think on average I've heard there's $60 a year per internet user generated from data. I don't know if that's the right number. I just heard it somewhere. Okay. That's a big number. We would take a small portion of that if we could. Let me just check. Um, Mark, restrain, self-restraint. Do you restrain yourselves on opportunities? Well, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the enterprise cloud. So what that means is, is that for our customers that we work with, you know, which are the, lar the General Electrics, the Philips, the BMWs, of course, it's their data. It's not any question. But on do nothing, we, do you, is that an option for you? Of course. We, we can't do anything without our customers saying uh, what we can do. Because, first of all, it's their data. They tell us where they want it, how they want to use it, what applications they're using it. We can't see it. The data is black to us. It's encrypted. But I think that that very much is a model for where the consumer companies are going to have to go. The enterprise companies are in a place where we recognize we can't do anything without our customers saying okay. That's our, that's our uh, agreement with our customers that we, that we sign with them. In the consumer world, it's a little bit different, and I think that's kind of what Mike is going to, which is that sometimes you know what's happening, sometimes you don't know what's happening. I, for example, I use a, a consumer uh, email service, okay? I'm not going to use any brand names. And I don't know where my email is. I don't know what country it's in. I don't know what laws are regulating it. Uh, I don't even know if, my, if the vendor knows exactly where the email is. And that's going to change, right? You, you can't just be searching on the internet, using consumer services, doing various things, and you don't know what's going on. You're going to have to have complete and total disclosure. Right, I'm just it's going critical. for a data point here as well. Uh, uh, with, and that's uh, why I think the enterprise cloud, if you will, is a model for the consumer cloud. But Marissa, no. can I just ask you as well, is, do you often take a decision to do nothing? Let me just quote you what Nijeka Harry has just said. 90% of consumers feel they've lost control of their data, despite what all of you have said. Well, I would say there's other statistics, too, that 70% of people like the Internet being personalized. 80% of people expect their smartphone to understand where they are. But 90% say they they've are, lost control. Et cetera. And so I think that this is why I brought up the principles of transparency, choice, and control. Control, consent, you can use either word. But the idea is that you are very actively acknowledging what you're doing. And we're being very open about how the data is going to be used and where it's going to flow. But you take active commercial decisions at the moment not to enter into a certain kind well, of... Certainly. So, I mean, we, for example, don't sell your personal data from Yahoo. So, you know, there's not, you know, you can't say, oh, I'd like to understand exactly what this person did. We might say, look, we've done an analysis on this group of users, for example, on audience advertising. Um, uh, and we may, for example, target at which point in time the data is still retained at Yahoo. But we definitely have principles that govern what we will and won't do, and we don't transfer your personal data to third parties. All right, we just wanted to check with all of you on the commercial side. Tim Berners-Lee, uh, we just heard from Mike this was a train crash waiting to happen. Is this the kind of train crash you always expected? Trust. I think that uh, that's a, a broader question than the one you've been asking everybody, but I think behind the, uh, this, this train crash feeling is, uh, uh, owes itself to a model that we all have, uh, partly it's been uh, you know, painted by the, the press, partly it's true, that here we are, I'm the poor citizen, I'm the poor consumer, and somebody and various, and I, I use these services, I have to because that's how I live my life, and then all these companies that provide the services, they're taking all my data and they're doing stuff with it and they're locking it away and they're, 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 they're selling it to other people and they're concluding all kinds of things about me that may not be true, but they're selling all those, these kinds of things to other people and it's got out of control because... Now, to a certain extent, things are out of control because on one end of the spectrum, there are, you, know, you, you can put a, a phone, on, uh, you can, before the iPhone, to, to, to mention a brand name, had the ability to easily turn on the flashlight, you could get thousands of different apps which would do it. And depending on which one you picked, you, you download the thing just to turn the flashlight on your phone, and it would ask access to your calendar and whatever, and then the calendar is, a, is the best one. And these apps are deliberately just done, made in order to steal your data, 
build a profile of you, and these, uh, these companies are in sort of n n nefarious in what they do, and they are just, their whole business model is stealing data and trying to build profiles of people and not help them uh, in their lives at all. Uh, then there are people in the middle that where actually there's, you know, like a lot of people around the table, they're trying to provide, they're providing a service, they're holding them, um, they're holding the data, and in fact, they're not, being, they're, they're not being nasty with data. They're having to do a certain amount of analytics in order to do a good job. Yes, personalized, personalized service is a better service. It takes, means that you can buy your clothes more quickly if everybody remembers who, what size your body is and things like that. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, and, uh, and in general there, one can have quite a lot of trust. Um, uh, and then there are some, uh, some places where actually the... Uh, the, so the, the app is completely serve, serving you. This used to be the case. Uh, in a way, perhaps you'd like, to, you'd like to put Salesforce in that case, because it's an enterprise app. There's a model there that, hey, you know, I, I, if I use this, I'm prepared to pay for it. In the old days, I used to pay for apps running on my computer, and they would be written by somebody who wanted the app to do good for me. Some people have been, I, I've been trying out the word, Beneficent, when you do tests on pe people, when you do experiments on the, on the web with people, one of the things you have to com convince, I have to convince the committee at MIT is, is what I'm doing beneficent? Is it basically good for users? And there's an old fashioned, I, I'd like, love to have a brand. And in fact, I've talked to a few people that are quite excited about starting this off. You have a, suppose we have a brand where we say, this is a beneficent app. That means while I'm writing the app, you're going to pay me for the app. And every time I think about how, what it's going to do with your data, I think about what you'd want. So yeah, I'd, so I'd. Or I so, will help us. So, and so that business model is one which has been almost completely lost. And I think we will end up moving to it uh, because I think people just get fed up with these other, but we'll end up with people making strong commitments to do what the user wanted. And I think we will get, and, uh, and by the way, it involves in creating a new architecture for how we store our data and how we a new uh, architecture craft it. Okay, well let, let's come back to that. We'll get um, back to it. Commissioner, um, w what's your view? You've heard um, uh, how they want to. They accept there's a problem. Do you accept in Brussels that there is a significant problem? Are you going to be reactive, or are you going to be able to work in advance of the problems? Given what Mike said about it, a train crash which was predictable, and it's probable that the next generation of problems in hyperconnectivity can be predicted, even if they're going to come incredibly quickly. We are in a digital revolution, and we need a data revolution in parallel, a smart and pragmatic revolution. Let me compare. Since decades and since centuries, first railway systems and trains, and they have so, we, we so many concerns, or take Henry Ford, Carl Benz, Gottlieb Daimler, his first cars as uh, entrepreneurs, as startups. And many said, no, we don't need cars, uh, we have horses. Uh, or uh, take first computers. And people are saying, mm, it's not good for the eyes, for the health. Uh, take biotechnical products for medicine or for food. And so there's a huge potential on the one hand, and there are some risks on the other hand. And we have to balance it out. And uh, Is trust and, and, something that you think that Brussels now has to get involved in? to try and make sure that the trust levels are higher than they appear to be running at the moment? No doubt. In Europe, we have not so many digital natives as the US. We are elder uh, citizenship. And uh, take the Sony case, take Snowden, uh, there are some concerns. And people don't trust. And so transparency is a clear first uh, advice. And the second point is we need a convincing global um, common understanding. At the end, we need a, a UN um, agency for data protection and data security. Um, mm -hmm. And what we are doing is to Europeanize data uh, protection uh, regulation and data security um, uh, rules. Uh, are you because moving? Because we, we have 28 fragmented, and that's not convincing. Uh, if anybody from, from out of Europe wants to make businesses in Europe. He goes to a member state with a low level of data uh, protection, and he can get all data from all over Europe. So our uh, data protection regulation, being in the council for the moment, 
our network information uh, security directive for data security are our offers to the industry, uh, to IT companies, telecom companies, to the whole industry, take uh, um, Internet of Things, take our Siemens, BMW, Mercedes uh, companies, and on the other hand, to our citizens. And when we are ready, then we would like to come into contact with the US, to Japan, South Korea, others, for to come to a global understanding, a global culture of a pragmatic, balanced data protection uh, system. Now, let me be clear, in your mind at the moment, um, are you moving, you use the word understanding, you also use the word regulation. Are we moving towards understanding, regulation, legislation? What is going to be the framing in your mind at the moment of how this can somehow be addressed to create a higher level of trust? You talk about technologies which frankly took a long time to evolve. And what we're talking about is hyperconnectivity, which is, uh, which is progressing at a rate which often is mind blowing because of both the capacity and the impact. We need a clear, pragmatic, market based uh, regulation. But it's additionally, it's the industry with codes of conduct or certification of mechanisms or it's designed for privacy. So it's both. It's a public-private partnership. We need uh, our parliaments, uh, and we need our industries and all players. And we have to come to a common understanding for legislation and for practices. Right. Is this achievable, Mike? Well, Market-based regulation? That's the big question. Well, um, I'm giving you yeah, the question. Uh, no, Can you, I'm, I'm what's answer your answer? You. Um, not in the near term. I how, think how long is the near term? I think it's going to take several years. That's my view. I mean, despite uh, the, the, the commissioner's ob objectives, and I think they're the right ones. I was just meeting with Angela Merkel. She has the same objectives. Everybody's intentions are good. But working in Europe for as long as we have, 25 years now, we know that getting 28 people to agree on one, 28 countries to agree on one framework, one set of standards and policies is not an easy thing. So I think you're going to find local parliaments, local governments, taking a stab at it, which is not great, but something needs to happen. And I, and I hope with your uh, and, and your colleagues' support, we can start some broad uh, uh, standards, because those are definitely needed. But all I right, well, let, let me just go around all of you very quickly, sure. Marissa. Uh, Market-based regulation, comfortable with that? Well, Achievable? I, I actually like Tim's idea better of the beneficent, beneficent <laughs> uh, marketplace, where you basically will just make a trade-off around who you trust, how they handle your data, actually probably monetize your data yourself, uh, and I think that that type of market-based force is likely to get to us to a better, more forward-leaning solution that comes up with advantages to end users more quickly. I'm tempted to ask you, Commissioner, are you now going to back, go back to Brussels and ask for the translations into multiple language of the word beneficent? Uh, <laughs> because I'm sure it's on Yahoo, but we can look it up. But Mark, what's your view about market-based regulation? I think actually the, what the commissioner said is proven to be the right answer, which is that we need... Achievable. And achievable. We need a public-private partnership. And we've already seen that the tech industry can get out of control. The entrepreneurs can get a little bit wild. Tim gave us a great example already. But we all have to go back to our friends here in Europe and Neely Cruz and her right to be forgotten concept, Vivian. which is... Not, what's that? Oh, sorry, Vivian Redian's right to be forgotten concept. Um, and uh, both of them have added a huge amount, actually, to uh, the conversation. And I think that that's a great example in that you've got Vivian and you've got Neely, and they have added tremendously to our industry, period. And one of the aspect is the right to be forgotten. That is not something that any entrepreneur were back where I'm from, which is San Francisco, was ready to implement because they want to keep that data in perpetuity, harvest it, do whatever they want with it, and not be held accountable by any user, current or uh, former. And uh, that's why for the government to come in, especially specifically the European government, and to say, no, this is something that we need, uh, that, is the that is the right role where um, uh, government needs to be uh, looking out for uh, uh, our rights and provide a safety, safety net to our industry, and that can only happen through partnership. All right, um, let me now uh, move to all of you. Um, I've got a lot of tweets as well. Who'd like to come in? Jonathan Zitrain, do you want to come in? Um, anyone behind me? Please. Uh, sit down, it's okay, just get a microphone. 
Uh, all right, I tell you what, while the microphone's arriving, has anyone got a microphone they could yeah. connect us with? Um, if you could get the microphone over there. Um, let me just ask one question, if I may, uh, to Marissa um, uh, about uh, Tumblr. Uh, another company uh, that uh, a company that you um, uh, you acquired. Uh, how does Yahoo manage trust within companies that it's acquired, like Tumblr? Uh, they conform to our standards, so we know that you know when someone comes to a Yahoo property, even if it's not branded as Yahoo, they're expecting that property to behave with the same principles that all the other properties that we have uh, pursue. And so we've worked to actually standardize their their terms of service and their privacy guidelines to ours. All right, fine. That from Vibo Kipan, Chipan. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for a great discussion so far. And Nick, I think you're really kind of on the right path in talking about self-restraint as one of the themes. And I think it's right that Mark has it pretty easy because his self-restraint is defined by customers that can negotiate with him somewhat on par because he's in the enterprise space. And I wonder, uh, Marissa and Mike have it maybe a little bit harder as do the rest of the consumer facing industries because they tend to push the envelope as far as they can and then they step in it in one way or another, real or perceived, and have to kind of retreat a little bit. It's kind of the sort of feedback that a donkey gets when it's hit across the face with a two by four. So what's your challenge? So my challenge is, is there a way to get ahead of that cycle and think about a set of principles, of declarations, kind of akin to the one that Marissa already invoked about you own your own data, that first would say, these principles are meant to be enduring. It's not you own your own data until we figure out how to monetize it. But when you hear Mike say it's gonna be several years. That's gonna well, fly by, and then I don't wanna- It was about governments agreeing, all agreeing. Yes. I mean, this could happen tomorrow, what you're describing. Yes, yeah. so I'd love to see principles that the companies unilaterally announce, possibly modeled after the kind of Magna Carta that Sir Tim has called for and with a Web We Want campaign has asked people to weigh in on. And I think those principles would include the sort of you own your data stuff. That's about the noun of people's data. And they should also be principles about the verb. And by the verb, I mean the algorithms. And uh, Marissa talked about personalization. People do like personalization, but as soon as you're into that, that's choices that the company is making about what to present you. Now it's advertising. I think we know more and more it's native advertising. Native advertising means advertising that doesn't look like advertising, mm -hmm. and it would be awfully nice to know that the company is representing you rather than an advertiser in sort of slipping in those suggestions. Okay, well, well here's, the, here's the thing. You don't really have to go any farther uh, on this issue than right here at the World Economic Forum because uh, you know we're a, we're a strategic partner of the World Economic Forum, so they use Salesforce, and they are okay managing all of our information. So of course they know when we walked in this morning. I don't know if you wear aware of this. You're wearing a badge, and that badge, of course, you know you had a reader, and they're collecting where you're coming yeah, but you in. You take that for granted. Hold on. They're, Mark and I had of a course, fascinating conversation last night. Of course, there's, <laughs> what are you going to reveal, Mark? <laughs> there, well, I'm just going to just give you a general, just a general idea here. There's ambient awareness of where you are throughout the conference, what sessions you're going to, what you're interested in, what you've clicked on on the website, what you've clicked on on the mobile application. What you tweet. Uh, what you've tweet. They're capturing all of your tweets also. They're bringing all of that in together. All your knowledge, these um, uh, coordinators who are in the room, at the end of all of the sessions, they write that capture all of the key knowledge uh, from the session. It all gets tagged and gets linked to the participant. You can find that if you go to the um, central uh, staging area, you'll see the graphical tools that they have that let you navigate that information. You can go to weforum.org and then get that knowledge that's coming out. Very useful for all of us, right? So I'm very passionate, for example, about the oceans. And I'm very interested in what's going on in the oceans. And I went into the oceans section yesterday for the uh, weforum.org and I learned a huge amount about the oceans because this system is really working. And they have, they're building knowledge, they're building networks of people, they know, you know, who you're like, who you're not like, who you're connecting with, you know, uh, uh, who, whose profile you're browsing, and they're trying to provide a better experience for you here at the World Economic Forum. And by the way, I think this year maybe it's running the most smooth as it's ever run. Would everybody agree? Who's been here before? I've been coming since 2002. And they're doing a great job. 
And um, Does now... Does it tell you how long you've queued for to get through security control? Well, no, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Do you trust them? Well, I'd like to just ask, is anyone worried on the trust issue? If you all want to come back next year, I don't think I can see any hands go up. But is it, is it implicit in signing up and accepting the invitation to your white badges, you all knew well, think, that this level of trust would be required uh, and an understanding that this would be charted uh, digitally in the way you've just described, Mark. Has anyone put up their hand expressing worry? You will come back next year if you put your hand up. Well, do we trust uh -huh. Klaus Schwab? We mostly do actually trust Klaus Schwab. Hang on, do I have to ask we that like question too? The stakeholder, you know, theory. We like the conference. He's a good guy. He seems like he runs a quality operation. We like the people he hires. You know, we're looking around at their eyes. They know a lot about us, though. Okay, but you know what? You don't have that opportunity Tim. with all vendors, though, right? Okay. You're not looking at everyone. Tim, come here. Well, like you to, you Tim, like you to. Uh, for, for a long time, they've, they've had online meetings, or they'd like you to meet on Toplink outside Davos. They'd like, originally, uh, they had a, some kind of early uh, video conferencing mm -hmm. system. The idea was, once you've come to Davos, you'd be available to all your peers, and this, this power group would, be, would all be connected through, through leading edge World Economic Forum technology. Now, in fact, it, 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 it maybe it was because it only allowed you to connect to that particular group, maybe, uh, maybe people didn't trust it. But there was a play there to say it's not just we're going to run a conference really smoothly with very dinky little badges, which yes, It's a was, social uh, network. They were saying, well, let's, meanwhile, let's provide you other things. Sure. So, I'm prepared for example, to move. So we've suppose, all, we've all sort of opted in to, to Suppose Klaus also community. would say, you know yeah. what, we're going to give you data about the, about the forum, but we're also gonna, we're going to give you some space on the world economic, because you're a, a world economic forum person, we're going to give you some space on our server that we will, you can trust us yeah, to keep. Sure. And you can keep your fitness data there, you mm -hmm. can keep your health data there, mm -hmm. you can keep all kinds of data, not just right. the economic forum. So then maybe, because if he could establish the trust, maybe people would like to use it for all kinds of different data because they could so stash it away yes. somewhere in Zurich. I feel we're moving yes. this debate into a new debate, which is in the World Economic Forum, we trust. <laughs> and I don't think we need to go there <laughs> in the last 25 minutes. But it is a nice metaphor, don't yeah. you think? Sure, it's okay. well worth raising, but right, um, I think there are wider issues here. Okay. Uh, Commissioner. That's the balance between uh, security and business uh, or other services. We are trusting Klaus Schwab, the police, the service, the hospitality, the security system as a whole, or we wouldn't uh, be here. And no doubt we have to pay <coughs> or not, but we need an uh, allowance for to come into, so we need a, a control system. The second point, um, uh, uh, Klaus Schwab is checking how many people are in a, um, a panel, in a forum. And so next year, he can say we need more energy uh, panels or more digital pa uh, panels or more uh, panels looking to terrorism and security or looking to Eurozone and to currency or to, to Draghi and the ECB. So I think it's a, a smart balance between security on one hand and uh, attractive <coughs> um, services on the other hand. We all like. Is uh, Matthew Prince in the room, having registered? Yeah, Matthew, you've just t sent a couple of tweets. Would you like to repeat them? <laughs> Hi, Mark. Um, you know, I think I think that transparency is clear, and so I'd love I'd love you to talk about your uh, Data.com product project and Jigsaw, uh, which you acquired, which actually pays people to upload uh, other people's contact information. Um, that, that seems a little uh, lack of transparent in terms of Salesforce's data right. policies. And you also made a point about selling data. Yeah, the, that's what data.com does is sells customers data. Okay, what we have is um, a service called data.com. And with that service, um, it's kind of like a, a Rolodex. And you can go into that service and you can um, uh, fill in somebody's name, their address, their phone number, look up other people, try to, like you would, with the white pages and the, and the phone numbers. And then when you're in Salesforce, if you're inside one of our contact pages, like let's say we're looking at the contact page for Michael Fry's Liberty Global, you can say uh, clean or update this data and update the data. So we crowdsource um, uh, the data and then we uh, use that data and uh, let our customers update it. Are you Update concerned about data. trust on this, Matthew? Well, I don't, I don't know about anyone else in the room, but I get a lot of sales calls that I don't necessarily 
uh, appreciate. And a lot of that is because a uh, service like Jigsaw has, without my permission, aggregated my contact information and made it more difficult for me to avoid those sales calls. So, Explain what that means in terms of the word trust. Well, it, it, I'm not, I, I'd actually like Mark to explain what that means in, in terms of the word trust. Mark? Uh, well, okay, that's, okay, that service, which is, you know, primarily available in the United States, is a service where exactly what I said, which is, it's, it's basically a giant Rolodex of, of contact information. So I could look you up and I can say, you know, I can see your, your address, your phone number, and all those things. You can also go to that service and opt out and say, I don't want to be in this service, and then there is no record of your information, if that's what you choose. But for our customers, for example, they, you know, they are sales and service and marketing organizations, and they do want clean records of data that's important to them. And through this crowdsourcing uh, ability, we had give them the ability to uh, update their data. Anyone else well, want to? Well, everybody in the room has the option of going to data.com and opting out. Of course. And everybody on the planet has got the option of, but wait a moment, does that scale? If everybody, in the, if I as an individual, I have to go to data.com and data.co.uk and go to Finland, and I, how do I know? Do, how do I know all these places that I'm supposed to opt out? Because, uh, he, well, I come here and I hear about them. If he took, because he tells us. Oh. Well, if there was, just like if you get an email mm. at the bottom of the email, let's say we're the largest email provider in the world. We own a company called Exact Target. And at the bottom of all those emails, you get an email. It says, unsubscribe, opt out. I don't want to see this anymore. I don't want to get this information. And I believe in do not call, do not email, you know, do not contact me. And um, that, that's this, how we handle it. This and then goes we to the wipe fundamental question of whether it's opt in or opt out. I mean, that's what you're raising. And, and our principles, hopefully, will be as we move forward consent, number one, transparent, number two, and ideally anonymous. So, you know, it is, it is helping you personalize, but we don't really know you. We're not selling your name, your address. Those are not easy things to, for everybody to do. They're easier for us to do because we're already getting $50 a month from you for broadband, for television. And we honor that. You're, you're paying us to provide this service. We're providing the service. But these business models are driven by advertising or other. There's no other source of revenue, really, other than monetizing that data. So those are two worlds. Well, I have to object to that because I think that, for example, we run a communication company. And there, you know, you're storing someone's personal data, right? I mean, by definition, if someone addresses an email to you, we're storing it. We have to actually hold on to that information. So it's more than just, it's not possible in some of these mediums to simply personalize but not actually know that it's you. Yeah. If you're, being, if you're, if you're storing someone's emails, if you're storing someone's client records, you actually need to know which account that was addressed to. And people actually want you to because they want you to keep it secure for them. What, what the question kind of is how you monetize that. I agree with you. You have to know things about them, just as sure. we have their credit card. Well, the is, how are you using it? That's to the issue of trust, you have to be able to store that information. You can, yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. you can then create a level of abstraction when you're, for example, targeting advertising, which is what we That's do. That's what I mean by that. But you still do need to act. You can't simply abstract it all because you'll just lose the... Given the Snowden simple. and also the counterterrorism problem at the moment, um, how much uh, has that raised much more questioning about your storage? of, say, emails. In other words, how would you say Yahoo now stands on what you might call the trust index when it comes to people now worried about uh, how much they leave with you and whether they've actually shut down or they've, they've uh, created dormant accounts now simply by not using what they've used up to now? Uh, well, I mean, the first thing that happened when we, did, when we heard about Snowden's allegations is we changed the way that we store data. We changed the way that we communicate data. We went to entirely secure connections on all of, of Yahoo's major properties, HTTPS. We changed the way we did encryption between the data centers to basically get a more secure environment for our end users because we realized that that's what they wanted. So we changed all of those things in response. Uh, to those allegations. And what was the impact on and trust? I d we didn't have a, a measurement necessarily before, but the measurement afterwards shows that people, their trust and their confidence in the service has rebounded as a result of it. They understand now that we're using more secure protocols to communicate and transfer their data. Okay, let me come to you, please. It's, you were going exactly where I was going, so I was surprised that Well, nobody, take us further. So nobody in, in, it's been 18 months, but nobody's <laughs> actually mentioned uh, trust is coming from the Snowden effect, that basically the major culprit, the person who proved, the entity that proved to be the least trustworthy was actually the government, and now we're actually turning, we're actually counting on the government to figure out 
uh, what, how we should actually regulate uh, data privacy. And uh, I was directing the question mostly at Mike and Marissa just because I can imagine that uh, almost regardless of any step that you take to establish tr uh, trustworthiness, uh, there's still a question, does somebody get to pick the pocket uh, and understand essentially what data you've collected, yep. even if you're not monetizing it? It's a great question, and the answer is yes. And the history of cable and telcos and almost anybody in the infrastructure business is a partnership with government. And um, it's not optional or voluntary. It's obligatory. So we do have lawful intercept um, uh, relationships with every government in which we operate. We don't have the object. We don't have the right to say sorry, you you know, Cameron, you cannot put people here, and you don't get access to that. We don't have that that right. Um, but I'll tell you what we do have the duty to do to our consumers for our consumers. We have the obligation to make sure that whatever the government is doing is abiding by the law. We have the obligation to to give some sense to proportionality. Is it, are they really doing what's necessary? Um, and we have, so we can protect our consumers. But in the end, you're right. There is a disconnect between data privacy and this issue of lawful intercept and data retention for the purposes of government. They're sort of above it on some level. I mean, I would just make the observation that protection and trust really come as a function of security and privacy. But there is a tension between those two. Um, for example, I think in reaction to Snowden, you saw a lot of people get very concerned about their privacy. And it became a lot more about encryption. But when things become about encryption, inherently it makes it much harder to keep things secure, right? Because then, you know, for example, if you're a government and you want to monitor for cyber crimes, terrorist threats, et cetera, you need to be able to actually see that data, to be able to monitor it, see patterns, et cetera. So there is going to be a tension in terms of are you communicating in an encrypted way, are you storing in an encrypted way? And it doesn't, it's not always obvious, but there's actually, I sort of see a pendulum swinging back and forth in public sentiment, where you, know, you saw Sw Snowden really swing that pendulum very heavily towards privacy. Now with some of the recent issues that have arisen, you're starting to see that pendulum swing back towards security. Uh, particularly after the, the recent incidents with much worse to come. I mean, I come from a country where the Director General of MI5 two weeks ago said it's, it's inevitable there's gonna be an attack, but and as a result, we need more ability to track within the algorithms and everything else that GCHQ has got. Uh, we escaped from the pendulum. I think one of the, uh, one of the things, which is a shame about this whole thing, is it's seen as a pendulum, as just being more police power, less police power, more power, and so. Is it but, only but, seen but, but in fact, let's look Tim, at- Tim, is it really only seen in that way? I think to a large extent, power. here, when in all the discussions I've been in, and people, you've mentioned, people mentioned pend pendulum, lots of other discussions I've been in, uh, it's been taught out as a pendulum as though it's a one-dimensional thing. I'd like to break out of that pendulum. I'd like to say that, for example, you say that you're asked for them, you, you can see that somebody's gone through the, pro court, the, the, the appropriate court process when they come and ask you Correct. for some data. Yeah. You give them the data, you can tell that they have gone as far at that point legally. You have no way of testing what they do with it then. So Correct. from that point, what we have not done is managed to build. So instead of just pushing one way or another, more power, less power, let's go in the direction of accountability. Say, well, if you want more power, then we need to build a system where you're accountable. So yeah, you can have the data, but I'm going to talk to the people that watch over you, and I'm going to see. I'm going to, we're, well, we, uh, have, we have set up a global council within our company. We do oversee these processes. We have you know, standards, and so it's not just, we just don't open the door, you know, the back door or the front door and say, come on in. We actually have, there's some, a proportionality and Commissioner, oversight. Commissioner, um, Pendulum, what kind of architecture is in your mind at the moment of how this can proceed? Because uh, Tim has just highlighted what he sees as this pendulum between more power, less power, the police intervention and so on. Where do you see it going at this stage in your analysis? Let me say, I think um, trust and transparency. Additionally, we need uh, to speak about a lack, a lack of information. Many people are not informed and many media <coughs> like uh, scandals, or uh, they say it's a scandal. Um, and, and so uh, we have a lack of information. It's a question of education in our schools, uh, our high schools, in our media. We need um, more competence of all our um, citizens. And then we have to divide the public sector and the business sector. Businesses uh, need data, and we have to uh, check which data to store um, is in our um, interest for new businesses. Take healthcare, 
take automotive mobility um, uh, and to optimize our uh, 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 roads and uh, highways and so on. And on the other hand, the public sector. Um, and I'm sure if our police, our uh, politicians are declaring we need data retention, then we can get majorities in the parliament and uh, in our citizenship. Uh, and so we need a deeper information. I think this two days uh, panel should be a panel for millions of citizens. There should are be, people should, out there watching Should be it. not just in Future Web, but in the ARD and in the ZDF and in all postcarding uh, uh, programs. We, we, we need a higher level of competence of everybody. All right, but it's also about perceptions, and perceptions can be made very quickly. And yes. interesting, the Edelman Trust Barometer yesterday, published two, two days ago, said very clearly that large numbers of people are not going to the traditional media organizations, they're going to the search engines first to get their information, then going to traditional media. Please. Yes, hi, I'm Yasmin from Egypt. Um, I had, from, I guess from what you're saying, we can all assume that our governments have rights to our information whenever we want it. But for, for governments, like we assume like the West would be looking just for terrorism. What do you do for governments who would abuse that just to silence opposition or freedom of speech, the, knowing that from past events that that can lead to their own interests? Um, Marissa, are you eroding. under pressure on that? Uh, well, I mean, I think that what we're seeing from the nation attacks, from the Snowden allegations, is whether or not they're coming through the official system to get the data. They are, in fact, getting data, right? And so we can do what we can do in order to try and protect our users, which is usually through encryption methods and the like. Um, but that said, you know, I, I, think, I think it might be the wrong question in terms of... No, but if, if, if a foreign government asked for permission to access your users, I assume you would give it to them too, right? I mean, it's, it's regulated by the law. So it really comes down to we, uh, we look out for the individual user. We assess every uh, request that comes in as to whether or not it's reasonable. Um, and we actually at Yahoo have a very good track record of standing up for what we think is not reasonable. Um, in fact, when the FISA law originally changed, allowing for what we consider to be an invasion of privacy, it turned out it was kind of ironic because we felt that the users would ultimately want to sue on their behalf and say, wait, this is an invasion of our privacy, except the law was secret. And it was tried in a secret court. There was a corporation, Yahoo, it was before I was there, that actually said, went in and said, okay, you know, we'd like to sue on behalf of the users and say this feels like an invasion of privacy that they're not going to know about. So, you know, we've done a lot there to try and make sure that those government requests aren't overly invasive. And we felt that, you know, our users couldn't stand up for themselves. We've assumed the voice of the user in order to try and achieve a better result for our users. Can you put a quantity on that to give us an idea of the scale uh, at which you've been, been able to resist and say no? Well, every, every request that comes in, we scrutinize, we look at the law, we look at the request. Um, and Is it large, you know, small numbers? I would say... Um, when we publish the numbers, it's you know more than a thousand, less than ten thousand. It depends okay. on if you're looking at local civil crimes or if you're looking at um, FISA, et cetera. And so we're allowed to publish ranges. What about so it, I think for a lot of people, it was it was it was actually less than they thought. Um, that said, it's still you know it's still a large number. What about so the, that? I think maybe the question was about uh, what about, about if you uh, if you have an, uh, a, a nasty oppressive re re regime? You talked about America. Uh, do you have? Uh, no, that, do, that's, do you our, have that's our policy around the world. In all no matter who, countries. no, so, no yeah. matter. No, no matter we will always say, look, and every request that comes in, it needs yeah. to be a well-formed, proper request. So if there's anything wrong with the request, we send it back and say this was improper. And so you know, there's often a lot of back and forth there. And we will say within the within the law, how can we stand up for the user? Uh, and how do we think this is? Do we think this is? Do we think this is a reasonable request? Uh, and is it in line with our terms of service and our users' expectations? Let, and we frequently push back. Let me, in the last few minutes, just try and push you forward um, as to where, say, we, we meet again this time next year, um, if we're all invited, having had the discussion a little earlier, um, about our trust in the World Economic Forum system. But if we're all here next year, are we going to be debating this again with, tech, with, tech, with trust having eroded even more or with a new kind of plateau? What's your, what's your expectation, Commissioner? Um, I think it's a mid-term issue, no increasing issue, but... The level, no increasing? I don't, I don't think so. Younger people are better informed than my generation. Um, so we have one more 
um, year of digital natives uh, here in, in, in Davos, I think, um, and outside as well. And there is some momentum in our legislation. Um, in, in many states, in our European Union, my expectation is we are ready by a decision of the Council before end of this year with our European data protection regulation. And the outline of it will be what? Um, the outline will be we have one level of data protection. So to inform our citizens is much uh, uh, more feasible as if we have 28 fragmented regulations. And um, it's uh, mainly this proposal from Vivian Redding, um, you mentioned. Um, and I think it's a, it's a balanced solution between uh, privacy, between citizens' um, uh, priorities, and between um, our businesses, our industries being able to work in our European Union. Mark, what's your definition of the way this will move? Are we going to be having the same debate if there were to be another Snowden-type series of revelations, either from him or somewhere else? Um, do you think that would once again make large numbers of people hyper-suspicious? Well, I think we have to kind of get back to, I think, one of Tim's earlier comments, and I don't know if this is exactly where he was going, but, you know, the Internet was designed, and when, you know, Tim was creating the World Wide Web, the, the internet was designed to be inherently insecure and unreliable. And today we have an internet that is mostly insecure and unreliable. Uh, it was a design characteristic. And, uh, you know, I think that the question is on the table is do we need an internet 2.0 that is, has a, you know, maybe not, doesn't have the same kind of protocols, doesn't use DNS, doesn't use TCP IP, maybe has a different, or it has a, a different type of uh, network capability, and uh, that would be something that would, I think, uh, create a, a different level of trust. But I'd really like Tim to finish the thought that he started uh, in that area, because I am I'm a proponent that we need a, an Internet 2.0 for certain networks that require high levels of uh, security that are not anonymous, that every bit is known, and that we um, are able to, uh, you know, uh, have the kind of authenticity on the network that I think a lot of the applications that we um, want uh, and have uh, require. What's your thinking on 2.0? Uh, the IP uh, structure underneath is fine because we've always built stuff on top of it. So we've always built secure things on top of That's what HBS does. It says, yes, the underlying net there is, uh, is insecure, but we've always built security on top of it. The security has not been very good, and it's also been a bit patchy so there's this big move to put encryption everywhere. That there's certainly uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, WCC, go to WC.org. The Technical Architect Group was spent uh, the last uh, 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 week or so has been talking all about bringing in encryption everywhere. Some of the spooks may be uh, terrified, may, may, but even where it isn't called for, where there's no S on the HTTP, the code might end up just encrypting stuff because there's this big push in technical community to, uh, I think there's a thing that was, uh, those, the trust issue led them to say, let's just encrypt things because, you know, uh, we can't trust what's go who's going to be looking at it. I hope, uh, so we're going to, there's going, there's going to be a lot of with things like certificates. I hope that if uh, we come back here next year, uh, that actually we're talking about uh, talking about things very much more positively. So rather than just worrying about the, the niggling fears uh, uh, that, uh, that people are going to be spying on us and doing the wrong things with our data, instead I hope that we've woken up to a whole completely exciting possibility when it comes to our data. I hope we've realized that the value of my data to some cloud-based thing which is figuring out things about my demographic and using it to affect my or somebody else is, is, is really, that, that is really boring. But the value of my data to me is really exciting. So I hope we're in a world where we have beneficent apps, where we have our data. I hope that we're in a situation where I can store data wherever I like, that I can store it with Klaus, I can store it with Mercer, we can store it, I can store it if I want, want on Salesforce. But it's stored there in a way where it's treated as mine. I control it. I can store the, my Yahoo data on Salesforce, so there, okay? And you can just run all your apps and store it on there. I'm in control. I get to control what happens to it. And in this magical, really exciting sort of future, 
I get to get all my data in one place. Mm -hmm. So I can do what industries all know they have to yeah. do, application integration. Any industry does. It has to integrate all the data from different places right. in order to be able to live. As a human being, I will be doing my personal data integration. And that's what we'll be talking about, hopefully, this time next year. OK. Mm -hmm. Is Barrett Brooks in the, in nice. the room? Is there a yes somewhere? Yeah. yeah. Could, could I come to you, Barrett? Because you've just tweeted two or three um, rather interesting and rather negative views about the way this is going. If I may quote, sounds like the back and forth between government and a company like Yahoo is probably a huge waste of time and resources. Yep, definitely. Why, why are you saying that? Well, it seems like it's, uh, it's probably pretty wasteful. And if the government's not taking the time to submit through the proper channels in the proper manner, then they're wasting business time. And that's annoying. What about your other skepticisms? About digital natives knowing mm. uh, about data privacy and things yeah. like this? Uh, I don't think that digital natives know about data privacy any more than anyone else. Uh, I think we're more familiar with the tools that we use that collect our data, but not how they're collecting our data necessarily. Tim? Digital, about digital natives? Yeah, I, I thought I, I saw a, a sort mm -hmm. of expression of scorn towards that. Uh, <laughs> not at all. I think uh, I misread. Maybe it was just a slightly raised eyebrow in that. I don't want, but uh, digital, I think you should never misjudge or underestimate digital natives. I think that, yes, uh, of course, there will be all, there will be all sorts of, uh, of people out there. Uh, there will be people in the... The, in the digital native generation who understand these things very well. And I think the people who don't understand it very well hopefully will learn from the people in the family that do. Marissa, uh, right. Um, and, and Mike, finally, uh, your, your, your sketch, if you can, of where the architecture might be or the pressures additionally that you might be under. Um, I'm pretty optimistic. I agree with Tim. I think that as users and companies and governments become more fluent, in all of these ideas, they get more comfortable with it. And that certainly is shown in other industries in a test over time. And I think that, for example, today companies are communicating more clearly about these concepts. A lot of companies are laying out privacy principles and privacy guidelines, putting up, putting the most important terms up front, not buried in the fine print, et cetera. And I think that users have, you know, we're, we're on that learning curve and they're coming up the, that learning curve in terms of what data is being collected about them, where it exists, how it's being used. And I think as both of those forces go to work, there ultimately will be uh, more trust and acceptance and a better understanding of the trade-offs that are being made. Mike, a uh, comment here from Ryan Heath. Opt-out systems much less effective and fair than opt-in systems for users and their data. Couldn't agree more. And I think we're ending where we began because David's comment was uh, digital natives don't know either. And really, people aren't aware. They're not, they, don't, they might think they're in control, but they're really not in control. And I think the things we've talked about today around transparency and opt-in and, and control are really the right directions for all of us. Um, Hopefully next year we're talking, maybe I, I hope that you're correct, that we are looking at a framework that gives businesses and consumers clarity. Because today there is nervousness, there is anxiety. This entire panel has been about anxiety. And hopefully next year we're not dealing with anxiety, there is some resolution around what governments will or won't do. And if there isn't general resolution in Europe, I worry that some countries will take it into their own hands, build their own intranets, Internets, balkanize the internet, which is not a good thing either. But China's already indicated it Germany, wants to do that. We don't want Germany to have its own internet. I mean, how does that work? Is that is that is any that more secure? Cards? Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, these are not the right. This is not the right direction. You know, I think in the end, uh, you know, if we have standards and clarity, then I think anxiety. You will act on the inter the interest of all Europeans, though, won't you? Okay, he nodded agreement there. Good. But uh, you say control. Is that the right word, that losing control? Confidence. Isn't it, how, isn't how it how having confidence. a handle, at least, on, on what is happening to the data? Yeah. Even yeah, if they right. accept, they don't control it. I think they're okay giving control to somebody else if they're making that decision voluntarily. As long as they understand what they're yeah. doing. Okay. Right. Well, look, thank you to all of you. Um, I fear we will be back. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I hope we're all going to be back. But thank you all very much yeah. indeed, and thanks for all your tweets.